So let me start with the uh, pandemics. Um, the numbers of uh, infected by coronavirus in both countries, but the whole region of Central Eastern Europe uh, have been uh, very low in, uh, in the um, European terms. This is um, an interesting transcontinental divide and we will come back to it during our discussion uh, looking at the numbers. What makes Poland and Hungary special is that there is a lot of attention now to what has happened in, in, in the political sphere. Um, it's rather their power polit politics of their leaders that, is, that has been going beyond the limits that also makes them special within the region of Central Eastern Europe. Um, Prime Minister Viktor Orban and Chairman Jaroslav Kaczynski have been taking advantage of this unprecedented health crisis to consolidate their power. And it is happening, I believe, at a very high cost for uh, their country's position in the European Union. This is something that we will discuss in, in the next um, hour. But before that, let me start with a question to Warsaw, as this drama is taking place now in in, in Poland, ahead of something unprecedented, there were supposed there are supposed to be presidential elections um, this Sunday, and still many things are unknown. Wojtek, you've been starting your days on Twitter with a message: there are so and so now five days left until the presidential elections, and we are still in the dark about how it will take place, when it will take place. So, what do we know now, five days ahead of 10th of May? You need to unmute yourself. Uh, we uh, know uh, a little bit more now. Uh, we know almost for sure that uh, the Senate, which is controlled by the opposition, will uh, veto uh, the law on the postal voting uh, that was adopted uh, a month ago by the same. Uh, it, is, it will happen uh, tomorrow on the 6th of May. Uh, in the evening, uh, so that the same has uh, as little time as possible. So uh, the final voting will take place uh, in the evening or perhaps even at night, but before the midnight, uh, because it's the last possible uh, day to proceed uh, in the Senate. And in normal circumstances, uh, this uh, veto would be overridden by the uh, same, uh, by the ruling coalition uh, on the 7th of May. Uh, this law enables to organize postal voting uh, and only postal voting uh, on the 10th of May, but the ruling coalition uh, would have a chance to uh, postpone the election uh, until the 23rd of May. Uh, this would uh, need a cooperation between the Prime Minister and the Marshal of the same. Uh, but yes, the uh, ruling party would have a chance to uh, switch the elections, uh, presidential election to uh, the 23rd of May. Uh, it would take place on Saturday and this would be the last possible date uh, of the election under this law uh, on uh, postal voting. Uh, what we don't know yet is whether the ruling coalition has uh, the majority in the uh, same. Uh, it, uh, when we go back to the, the election day, uh, the parliamentary election day in October, uh, Peace, together with its two junior coalition partners, uh, gained 235 uh, MPs uh, in the same. Uh, which is five above uh, the threshold uh, of uh, majority. But uh, Jaroslav Govin and some of uh, his colleagues from his party agreement uh, disagree with Jaroslav Kaczynski over the issue of uh, postal voting. And we don't know uh, whether Jaroslav Kaczynski managed to crush uh, Govin's party uh, or uh, talk uh, some MPs from other uh, parliamentary groupings uh, into supporting uh, the law. Uh, so this voting uh, will uh, is likely to take place on the 7th of May uh, in the same and no one, no, no one really knows for sure uh, whether peace will win this voting. Uh, and also the opposition doesn't know that. Uh, it might 
come down to one or two votes. Uh, peace needs uh, 231 uh, votes. Uh, and if, for example, five MPs from Porozmienie, from uh, Govin's party, uh, vote together with the opposition, uh, this law uh, goes to trash and uh, we don't know where we are because there are no rules, no uh, possible uh, dates of the election and no legal framework, framework to organize the, the election. Wojtek, Poland is the fifth largest EU member. Would you say that it's now on the verge of constitutional crisis or political chaos? Or what is likely to happen even in, in, with these presidential elections post the vote? or postponement? What are your assessment as political analyst? Well, if uh, peace wins uh, the, uh, this voting on the 7th of May, uh, we uh, will likely have uh, to have a uh, presidential election, uh, postal presidential election uh, carried out by Polish Post uh, and the one of the ministries. Uh, had, uh, which is uh, governed by Jacek Sasin, the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, and this raises serious uh, doubts uh, whether uh, this election uh, will be in any way uh, normal, democratic, and so on and so on. Uh, but it will be possible for the, gover for, for the governing, uh, for the uh, power uh, uh, it will be possible for the ruling camp to uh, organize this voting. But how much is prepared? Uh, it's uh, Poland who has uh, 30 million eligible voters. If you do it by post, plus I think also Poles who live in other countries are eligible to vote through the embassies. This is a huge logistical operation. How to do it so that at least to keep um, a claim that this, this vote will be well done, democratic and legitimate? Yes. Well, I don't think it's possible, uh, but the representatives of uh, peace, uh, ministers uh, and political leaders claim that it's possible to organize it on the 17th uh, or the 23rd of May. Uh, and perhaps they will do it. There, there will be lots of mistakes, there will be lots of protests, uh, but they are determined to uh, do so. It, but um, they they will have to first to win this uh, voting on uh, the seventh of May. Uh, otherwise, we have to we have to wait for Thursday evening and then we'll yes. see what happens next. Yes. Um, and so if uh, peace loses this voting, uh, there are lots of options on the table uh, from uh, the fall of the government and early uh, parliamentary election. Uh, to uh, serious constitutional crisis or to uh, declaring state of emergency, uh, which would mean uh, postponing of the presidential election. Thank you. Wojciech, we'll go to Brussels, um, to, uh, to Matthias. Uh, to me, as uh, somebody who has been following uh, politics uh, um, in uh, Central Eastern Europe for three decades, this is something unprecedented what is happening now in Poland. So we have an absolutely unique <laughs> in um, un, sort of event that is coming, which is unknown, not well organized in the, at least in, uh, um, in the last um, 15 years that our countries have been in the EU, this has not happened as the pandemics has not happened. But is there, what would you say in terms of attention in Brussels, uh, Matthias? Um, has this Polish drama attracted some attention in the media and uh, from the officials in European institutions? I think there is a, I think there is a lot of attention being paid to, to what's happening in Poland. I think also at least the, what we in Germany often call the, the Qualitätszeitung and I think uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine writes a lot about what's happening in Poland about the muscle law. We at Süddeutsche write a lot, the Spiegel, uh, we try to push the issue and just again report about what's happening. But I think, of course, from a media perspective, it's always challenging if there are these developments that are 
have been going on for years and years. I think sometimes it's it's difficult to convince our editors and then the readers or the viewers that just like, hey, it's important to pay attention again to what's happening in Poland or in Hungary. Because I think for years, of course, they have heard that things are not going in the right direction. For them, nothing changed so much. So that's that's sometimes challenging. But I think here in Brussels, there are a lot of members of parliament who pay a lot of attention to what's happening in Poland. There are a lot of journalists here, Brussels, in normal times, but also virtually is one of these places where, I mean, there's a pan-European uh, public every day we can ask questions and the Polish journalists are asking uh, questions about that all the time and the Germans do and the Dutch and the Swedish. So um, I think there, there, there's a constant debate about what's happening. But of course, um, it's, it's, I think it's, and it's also fair to say that I think uh, Commissioner Jurova, who is handling that portfolio in the lead, I think she is uh, well liked. I think people don't don't question her integrity. People don't question that she really cares about that issue. But at the same time, I think here in Brussels, there's also the sense that the infringement procedure that was started last week about the, um, the muscle law, it came too late. It could have started uh, weeks ago and people have been pushing and calling for that. They called on Ursula von der Leyen to do that. They called on Jurova herself, a lot of open letters. And that's of course something where people don't, people have questions about it. The, the explanation is always like, we had to do it properly. We had to go to the legal services. They have to check and do all the stuff and blah, blah, blah. But I think there is a certain mood in Brussels that uh, Ursula von der Leyen is new, she uh, wants to do a restart, she needs the polls uh, for the Green Deal, for a lot of other uh, other issues that are important, so maybe she didn't want to step on the toes of, of Mr. Kaczynski too early. So and I think also, it's hard to prove that, it's hard to prove that, but it's um, it's just something that's, that's always there. And the last point is I think also that um, with uh, Franz Timmermans, who pushed the issue very hard, there is a certain sense in the commission that uh, he, he just burned all the bridges and it didn't work. So maybe it's better now to, to try to, to have a more, an approach based on dialogue, common sense, that kind of stuff. And we are also discussing something uh, which has not happened yet. This is a pretext to um, presidential elections that we don't know when and at what conditions are happening, but first they have to happen. Right? Exactly. I. I mm -hmm. Exactly. I just watched uh, the press conference from last week again to prepare for this event. And I think all that Jurova can say is just like that. Um, we will watch it very closely. The Polish uh, authorities have to guarantee uh, that it's a fair and free election. Um, so she, she could just call on the authorities and she can say, I, as a Polish citizen, I would be very concerned about that. I would see candidates campaigning. I would have the possibility, possibility to inform myself. And uh, she's very concerned about that. But I think so far, there's nothing more she can do. She can use the bully pulpit and try to raise awareness, but I think that's a little bit uh, where her hands are, are tied at the moment. And the big decision uh, and big discussion in Germany and all over the media is the decision by German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe today at 10 o'clock in the morning and decided on the quantitative easing of uh, European Central Bank. That has a huge impact on the um, agreed um, rescue mechanism or pandemics program um, at the last summit. Um, what's the mood in Brussels about this decision? It's, it's a little bit hard to say because uh, now in Brussels also everything is virtually. So I think in, in normal days, it would be, it could give a better, uh, better answer just by sensing the mood of just like all the journalists gathering ahead of the midday briefing and just like being excited. And, and, and I think in this case, also a little bit shocked and, 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 and anxious just because I think, uh, it can really be called a revolution. The German German constitutional court has said that that is unconstitutional. That uh, the German government has to find a way to make that more in a more legal way. Within three months, um, this 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 program would have to stop. I, I have to say, I'm not I'm not kind of like a business correspondent. Not exactly what I write about, but I think the implications are huge on um, how the whole uh, uh, pandemic rescue plan is about to work. Where the ECB has played a crucial role, and I think of course now there are a lot of uh, members of parliament and experts who say, okay, um, that's the price uh, the European governments or the Eurozone governments have to pay because they've only relied on the ECB to kind of like be the one with the firepower and to take out the bazooka and, and, and solve some problems. So I think that will be very challenging. And what, what I heard also, like I received a number of, of, of messages by people who are concerned about rule of law, um, people who are active in their 
uh, network of European uh, justices. And they've said just like, oh my God, just like if, if, if I was uh, Viktor Orban or, or Mr. Kaczynski, I would be happy. I mean, the German constitutional court is just like, is really challenging uh, the European court of justice, just like, and that's, that's, that's something they don't like. So they, they say that's, that's not okay. We will not accept it. So I think there's also a big fear that this could, could be, could have, could have side effects way beyond the economic sphere by opening a, another door for certain uh, parties or government to say like, hey, um, at the European of course of justice uh, does a ruling that I don't like, uh, I will not accept it. And uh, now I have another explanation uh, or another reason I could twist uh, and use for, for not accepting it. Plus these days, um, as a result, there will be less attention on other issues. Exactly. Um, we switch to Hungary. And uh, Zsuzsa, let me, let me start by asking you if you have any, any brief uh, comment on, on what's happening in Poland or what we have discussed before so far? Um, well, I think if you look at it from uh, the Hungarian government's uh, perspective, then I think two small comments would be uh, you. One is that, of course, uh, from a Hungarian governmental perspective, um, it would be um, beneficial for the relations if uh, Andrzej Dudek would maintain his uh, position as president and if uh, things went ahead smoothly. At the same time, uh, if we think uh, following the logic of uh, the Hungarian government as it was put down in the so-called empowerment law or the law on protection against coronavirus adopted on the 30th of March, holding elections uh, in such times is uh, particularly curious. So um, you probably know that in, um, in this framework of the empowerment law, the Hungarian government uh, suspended by-elections uh, for the duration of the state of danger. So if we just follow this logic, then um, the Hungarian government uh, would not uh, comment the Polish uh, initiative to push ahead with the election. Of course, the Hungarian government will not comment on that. Um, Fidesz government, um, headed by Viktor Orban, has been in power for 10 years. In fact, there was a 10th anniversary recently of, of, of Fidesz uh, winning the elections in 2010. Um, and most of the time, is ha um, Fidesz has enjoyed constitutional majority in the parliament, and it has enacted new constitution, and so on and so on. Uh, peace in Poland came to power in 2015, and as we heard now, it's not even certain about whether it has simple majority in the parliament over this postal voting law. Um, using this super uh, position, um, Prime Minister Orban pushed through parliament dominated by Fidesz this um, law that empowered him to rule by decrees on the 30th of March. These extra powers arguably can be used also for more than just health related issues. Uh, what is the track record so far? I know that you, has, you have written uh, an analytical paper looking at the first four weeks. So what have you found out? Uh, yes, first of all, uh, I think we need to uh, acknowledge that um, this empowerment law, at least in my view, is not really a turning point. I see it much more like uh, a next step in uh, what is becoming an increasingly illiber illiberal and uh, authoritarian style of uh, governance in Hungary. Um, when it comes to the track record of the first uh, month by now, um, I think again, we need to consider two things. One thing is that you rightly said that the yeah. empowerment law is uh, granting Prime Minister Orban right the right to uh, rule by, um, govern by decree, to uh, amend, suspend uh, existing legislation as long as it is argued to be um, in the interest of uh, resolving the crisis. So on the one hand, we should look at the track record of the decrees. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is true that the parliament continues to be in session. Therefore, we need to also see what is happening there. So 
So when it comes to the decrees, I think uh, the report of the first month is actually uh, quite worrisome in some regards. Some decrees have been passed um, violating, infringing upon uh, data protection rights, um, which are not necessarily in line with GDPR itself. Um, also, some um, measures have been taken just very recently to limit access uh, to public information, uh, prolonging the uh, response period in uh, which uh, public institutions need to answer these requests. Okay. From Sorry, let me, let me let me let me jump slides. in here. Mm -hmm. let me I don't hear you, Milan. How about here now? No, yes. <laughs> sorry. Let me jump uh, there. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have a question about narratives. Yes. So as in the Polish case, the, there, there is a huge clash about what's happening in terms of what the ruling camp says about the presidential elections and the postal vote. They have one narrative and then there is an opposition and there is independent media. In Poland, you can talk about the media market that is still pluralistic. You can't talk about pluralistic media market in, in, in Hungary, which is dominated by, um, by, by, by various, um, or you, can, you, you, you can explain to us why there is only uh, one television and, and, and um, small outlets. So is there a, one dominating narrative uh, on what's going on by the, by the, by the governing party? And nothing else, or the other narratives um, have a chance to be to to, to be heard. Comes to narratives, uh, what appears in the public uh, first. So, uh, when it comes to narratives, uh, what uh, appears in the uh, public media, which is under uh, governmental control is uh, the usual frame of uh, a fight against an enemy. Uh, in this case, it is uh, the virus um, in a very hostile environment for Hungary. Hungary is, of course, uh, equated with the Hungarian government and vice versa. Um, this is a narrative frame that we have uh, been familiar with for years, you know it very well. And uh, this is, of course, the dominant narrative, but I think the real problem here is not necessarily just what narrative is dominant, but what information uh, is accessible. And uh, in this regard, um, the government has uh, developed um, quite a controlled environment. Uh, Milan, you have mentioned the Hungarian media landscape, which is dominated by um, governmental uh, interests uh, and the independent media uh, has been functioning in an increasingly uh, shrinking space. Uh, what we have been observing since um, the uh, state of danger has been announced is an even more in uh, increasing uh, restriction on this space. First of all, uh, by now, I think we know uh, about the amendment to the criminal, uh, um, criminal code, which um, punishes with uh, prison terms uh, the spread of uh, fake news uh, in an attempt to fight uh, misinformation. This amendment had put uh, a lot of pressure on not only journalists, but also on their sources who uh, feel that this very uh, flexibly um, defined uh, legislation can uh, endanger their uh, freedoms. Uh, furthermore, um, the, I mentioned that there is now even further restriction on access to public information, meaning that from 15 days now, the response time of public authorities uh, has been uh, increased to 45, which is incredibly long. And uh, finally, we need to also mention um, the access to information directly from the government and from um, this operational unit that is currently in charge of dealing with the crisis. And uh, here I would like to highlight that uh, although there are daily pressers, 
uh, this has been moved to the online space um, and journalists have to submit their questions uh, via email in advance. This resulted in a situation where um, the questions are cherry picked by the uh, officials and a lot of questions of uh, independent media outlets are not answered. Um, in the current situation, of course, having online pressers is justifiable, but also there could be other ways to make sure that all, uh, all questions are answered and these are not. Um, we, we have to leave it there. Um, uh, Matthias, reactions in Brussels um, to um, um, Prime Minister Zorban ruling by decrees and so what's happening in Hungary? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's worth to, as is always useful in Brussels to, to go a little bit by the, constitu uh, by the institutions. Um, at the press conference last week, uh, Commissioner Jourova, she said that uh, what they're saying all the time, uh, more than 20 of the EU member states have passed some kind of emergency COVID response uh, law, so they're monitoring everything. And she said, I, I really wrote it down, when we read the law from Hungary, it does not raise the reason to start an infringement procedure yet. And what she always stresses is the yet, which is something when we talk about narratives, which uh, the feeders uh, media, Katalin Novak, which they always leave out. I mean, they take her quotes as kind of like, okay, Brussels uh, gives us the salvation, everything is fine. But what, what Jurova is always saying, just, okay, when the, when the uh, legal services look at the law, they say there's nothing we can do right now because um, parliament could take it back. They are worried about that there's no sunset clause, this eternity thing, but of course, legally, they could take it back. So at the moment, they don't see anything they can do. But of course, they always stress that just like if you look at, take a look at history and context, then of course, we are extremely worried. This is something what, what von der Leyen has also said, because of course, they all know about um, uh, their, their, the power grip in, in Hungary, uh, the infringement procedures have been going on, how the media has been weakened and all these things. So um, I think they pay close attention to it, but so far they could not do a lot. In the European Parliament, uh, in the European Parliament, there it's it's not perceived as very convincing. People are pushing that quite a bit, especially uh, Social Democrats and the Greens, but also some members of the European People's Party. So like the Christian Democrats, there are also more and more who say um, this is against um, the idea of, of rule of law and the European treaties. There was a resolution passed in, in April uh, by the European Parliament with significant votes by, by some of the Christian Democrats. So there, there is something, there's something happening. But of course, um, Any if you look at- if you rumors uh, about the um, suspension of Fidesz, which, is, which was prolonged, and uh, there was a push of uh, small parties of the EPP to expel uh, from Fidesz. Um, yeah, I think, I think this will remain kind of like a, a Twitter debate and a debate of open letters because, um, I mean, Tusk has come out very forcefully that, that he wants to, to have a decision. And I think he doesn't see a place for Fidesz in the EPP, but um, this can be only decided in, by, a, by a body of EPP, which is called the political assembly, which can only meet in person. They will not meet in June. I think now they want to meet in, in early September in, uh, in, in Athens, Greece. And I think before mid-August, nothing will really be decided about that. And of course, the truth is that because I kind of like have these two hats, I, I sometimes speak for the Brussels perspective, but of course, also for the German perspective, I think as long as CDU and CSU have not decided uh, how they want to, how they want to go on or whether they want to call for, for, an, uh, for fetus to be kicked out, um, they're, they're, we are in this weird status where there's about one third, 40% of, of, the, uh, of the delegates in the political assembly or of the member states um, of the member parties uh, want fetus to be kicked out. Uh, it's interesting that now it's more the, 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 the Spanish, the French, the Italian conservatives, they are fighting for fetus because they don't want to give to uh, extreme right parties in their member in their countries uh, uh, kind of like some political leeway. Um, but but I think a lot would be decided on by by uh, CDU CSU in the end, and there's no real movement that that I can see. But um, when we look at the member state to go through the last of these institutions, it's quite obvious that you see um, a lot of criticism also publicly coming from what could be called the EU 15, kind of like the old older member states until the Big Bang enlargement in 2004, with the only exception of Austria. But, uh, and of course now the UK is no longer on board, but the 13 other member states, they came out publicly against what's happening in Hungary. And the rest, uh, in Eastern and Central Europe, from my perspective, it's more 
that uh, they are, some of them are supportive, but I think most of them just stay silent because they feel they don't have a lot to gain from that. There are some who perceive it as a, um, this typical Eastern Europeans are still second class members. They are treated differently. Nobody asked about uh, what the Italians were doing when they did not follow the, the um, human rights law during the refugee crisis, all these things. So it's this weird bubble and uh, there's still enough member states with enough uh, voting powers in the councils um, to, to, to have it on the agenda, to go on with the Article 7 procedures against Hungary and, and Poland, but it's kind of stuck. It's, it's stuck somewhere. It's like, like it's on the agenda, you can discuss about it, but uh, it will not go to the end and, and, and it will also not be, not be stopped. Last question before I open up uh, uh, about the EU budget. Of course, uh, um, Ursula von der Leyen, um, um, President of the European Commission, was tasked by the leaders at the last uh, European Council to prepare a new budget. Um, there will be conditionalities. Um, of course, the budget will be completely revamped on to fight the, um, the, 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 the pandemics and the uh, economic repercussions. But um, there is an exception that there is an expectation that somehow rule of law will be uh, discussed as well, and there might be conditionality tied to it. What do you hear in Brussels? Yes, I think it, I think there's consensus that some kind of conditionality. You can wrap it up in one minute. Mm -hmm. uh, will be part of the the package. Um, the question is just like how how strict it will be, and just like and how you could turn it around if the Commission says Member State X, um, you're not following the rule of law, and how you deal it with the with the budget. So something will be in there. The last proposal in February was quite a weak one, but I think it's, 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 it will be this monster bargain where you just don't know what, what, what will come out in the end. I mean, I think most of the um, cent Central European uh, and Eastern European member states, I mean, they want to uh, fight for the cohesion funds that they will stay at the same level, that they will not all go to COVID recovery. So maybe there's, an, there's a way to say, okay, if, we want, if you want to get more of the cohesion funds, um, then you have to kind of like swallow that, that, that bitter pill of, of a better rule of law conditionality. But it's, it's, it's too early to predict. We don't know the numbers, um, the proposals that von der Leyen has to draft. It could come in a week, it could come in two weeks, but it will be a monster bargain. And I think what everybody knows and is talking in Brussels as well, to solve that issue, we'll need a, you will need at least one physical meeting. It's impossible to do that via Zoom, as nice as it is to see all these friendly faces on my screen. But no, 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 to, to fix MFF and everything related to that, you have to be in a building, you have to do the deals, you have to do the schmoozing, you have to do the arm twisting uh, and all that stuff. So I think uh, we will talk about that for, for weeks and months to come, I'm afraid. And you are unmuted. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Very, very, very good. Marina, please share with us the slide on the, um, on the rates of deaths uh, from coronavirus in European countries per million. So we can see where Hungary and Poland and the whole Central Eastern Europe is. There is a striking transcontinental divide. Um, there was an article in Financial Times last, last uh, week about it. So far, Spain has recorded uh, 515 deaths per million people, Italy 453, um, Austria 65, and a huge contrast, Poland 16, uh, Hungary 37, actually from the V4, Hungary still has the highest uh, number. But it, um, it, it, it seems that um, not only the region has been lucky um, and it has been, uh, it, it, the virus spread out um, um, later than to Western Europe, to, to, to Central Eastern Europe, but also um, governments have been very strict and careful with the lockdowns and they acted early. Um, is this something that is, that is also seen in Brussels, Matthias? I can acknowledge to just be, one, one, two sentences. Yeah, please. to be honest, I think it has not come up quite a bit. I think it's, I think it's the Brussels focus is a lot on, on, on Italy, on France. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it has not, it has not, it has not been seen as just like a, a big achievement or something we can learn from. I think that's the same in Germany too. I think just like we have not looked when it, when it comes about, should we all wear masks? I think people don't look at Czech Republic or Slovakia where people have been wearing masks for a long, long time. Uh, uh, but we, then we look at Taiwan and say, like, oh, those East Asians, which I think also tells you a little bit about the German perception of, um, yeah, or just where we look at. 
Very good. We have 20, thank you. We have 22 minutes for uh, Q&A. And let me ask Marina to once again remind us how to um, ask your question or post a comment. You have to unmute yourself, Marina. Hello? Milan, uh, to ask the question, please use um, raise the hand button on your screen and uh, wait until the chair addresses you. We, you also may write your questions into the chat. And for those who are watching us uh, on YouTube, we uh, invite you to um, ask your questions uh, in D DJP Twitter. Um, we are encouraging you to have your video or on while speaking and please don't forget to unmute yourself. Very good. So I'm looking for raised hands. Now. And Marina, please uh, help me. There are two questions in the chat. Um, the relationship, so from Francisco Branco, the relationship between the Hungarian government and the European Union will be quite different after the pandemic. Well, that's a very general question, if you can take it briefly. Um, yes, I think um, this crisis um, certainly heightened tensions. Um, so I kind of see this as a uh, just exacerbating present processes. Uh, something where I do uh, feel uh, a difference is the conflict between um, the ruling party, Fidesz, and uh, the EPP leadership. I think with uh, the EPP leadership, namely uh, President Donald Tusk, the conflict entered also to very personal uh, domains, and I see that uh, beyond politics, this will be uh, harder to walk back from, and this is a new quality of conflict that has been brought in. Um, we have a question from uh, Lukasz Grajewski, um, German or correspondent of Polish press agency in Germany. Question to Matthias Kolb, what are the possible reactions of German government um, to holding the presidential elections in Poland in form of postal voting. Until now, only SPD politicians criticized the idea openly. Does um, the conservative camp, CDU, CSU, have another approach or they are deliberately silent about it? So it's, <laughs> it's more question to, um, to you if you follow German politics from Brussels. Um, I think... It's it's true that I haven't I haven't read or heard German or CDU CSU politicians speak about it. I I think that a they would probably just wait about the outcome that they don't feel that they have a lot to gain by 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 speaking out and criticizing the Polish government. I think that's more kind of like my understanding that I think German Polish relations are also not in the best shape. <laughs> so that I think and 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 that of course I think Polish media follows a lot what, what German politicians are saying. And I think there are a lot of German politicians have also learned that just like lecturing uh, or like that's like advice that they give in, in, in maybe in good spirit can often be perceived as lecturing and then doesn't really help a lot. So yeah, whether there's some kind of agenda or strategy behind that, I, I, I simply don't know. What I can add is today the um, um, Polish German reflection group between the two foreign ministries and and departments of analysis and planning was taking place with uh, a few uh, representatives of think tanks. Um, we were discussing EU issues and this question was politely mentioned by, by German participants, but by think tankers, not by diplomats. Any other, so let's see where are raised hands. There's, there's another question I think for me. Oh, <laughs> if we want yes. to about Bavaria, sorry, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and also, um, I, and go ahead. There's also a question about the, but I think you kind of answered that. Just like to sum it up, there's also a question whether, can like Polish politicians are trying to to convince the Germans why they are doing that, and the uh, and the other way around, whether there's some kind of like reaching across the aisle. Um, 
I don't know exactly how that's happening in Berlin. I don't think that it's happening. I think in, and in Brussels, my sense is that there was more like a, uh, the, the discussions are only in camps. Uh, so I think, of course, if there are the Polish Christian Democrats, like, I don't know, Mr. Sikorski, who talk a lot with their um, members of their political party, and then they explain it, or they are uh, Polish Social Democrats who speak with Katarina Bale, who does a lot about Poland. Um, but I think there's, there's, and of course, there are, I think, two dozen peace uh, uh, members of the European Parliament, but there's rarely a, a discussion happening that I feel. I think there's, there's everybody's dugging in their heels and just like, and they follow the narratives and they're also not, they don't have a sense that they're gaining something from, from, from reaching out and discussing and trying to convince it. At least my impression, it's just like, sadly, it's, it, we are beyond this, this point where people feel like, hey, I could convince you of something else. So just like everybody just keeps, keeps on going. And the last question is about the, um, the fact that Bavaria held a uh, post election during Corona. Um, I think I had heard that and I just know that the reaction from, I think, the Bavarian authorities was that it was just the, um, the, what we call in Germany, like the Stichwahl. It was kind of like the second round of election um, where, um, and before people could, uh, people, the candidates could campaign, it was on a local level. So people had a better knowledge of, um, of, uh, of who was running um, and that they felt it was, it was okay to do that. And I think also the fact was mentioned that uh, in Germany, uh, voting by mail has been done for, for years and years and it's becoming more and more popular. So there was also nothing, nothing new that has to be done and the postal services were not, uh, were not it was not new to them. Or, and, and, and back then in mid-March day or late March day, they, they worked quite well. But I think it's an, it's an interesting development or like it's interesting to point out that was something that I learned when I came to Brussels for the first time that something that happens in Germany or in France or in Netherlands that is kind of tied or, or similar to what Western Europeans criticize about Poland or Hungary is always mentioned in the press, and then the Commission is asked to to uh, comment on certain certain things. For example, Polish correspondents often stress that uh, it's the Bundestag who uh, votes for uh, who votes on the constitutional courts, and that political parties picking them. So just like why is that so different from uh, from uh, from the Polish case where where there's some political influence, but. I think, so I think if, I try to summarize, to if I try to summarize what you're saying is that Brussels is very polarized uh, along the yeah. political families, attention is elsewhere, and uh, Poland is not much on the radar. Um, I think it's Adam, kind of on the radar. It's just like, it's just, it's just, it's just, it seems so difficult to, to, to do something. I think that's just like the, the, the big thing, just that like people, people follow, but ugh, what can you do? Adam Tracik has a question. Yeah, I have a question to, to, uh, to Wojciech Szatki, which I think is, uh, is quite important when you look at the Polish political uh, scene right now. It's actually for the first time, until now, uh, Polish united right uh, or the peace camp was in most of the cases uh, very united. It was like one fist uh, actually, uh, and difference were, were managed. So it was inside, inside of the camp. And right now we see for the first time very, very important cracks, major cracks, uh, within the governing coalition. Uh, so what is your take on, on the future of the government uh, right now, uh, despite if the, if the election actually goes on or not? So um, will the coalition hold on? Are we looking at new uh, parliamentary elections? Uh, is there going to be a minority government? What is going on on, on the ground in the, in the ruling camp? Well, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, Jarosław Kaczyński, I guess uh, he's uh, his power is uh, the weakest since uh, 2015, since he came to power. Uh, he has, for uh, five years, uh, he hasn't been troubled by uh, any voting in the parliament. Uh, the majority was rock solid and uh, nothing seemed to hurt him. Well, as you mentioned, there are uh, serious cracks in the United Right, and I think, and still, there is a huge gap between this, uh, uh, these problems in the parliament uh, and the social sentiment. Uh, if a parliamentary election uh, were held today, uh, I guess peace would be the winner with, uh, again, um, majority. 
and even perhaps bigger majority than it uh, was uh, in the autumn. So Jarosław Kaczyński might be tempted to organize early parliamentary election uh, in August, let's say. Uh, so perhaps it's one of the ways uh, to get rid of uh, Govin's party, uh, perhaps uh, the, the civic uh, platform would uh, be very weak in this elections campaign. So the opposition on the whole would be uh, either not ready for it uh, or uh, very, very uh, weak. Uh, so yes, I think uh, it might end up in the early parliamentary election uh, in um, early autumn or uh, late uh, summer. Uh, and this also, also as a postal or combined, or is this a big test for even parliamentary elections? What will be happening in the next few weeks? They will have to uh, create some le legislation for this uh, election. I, I don't know what will happen, but we will know more certain, certainly after uh, Thursday uh, if Kaczynski loses this uh, voting in the same. Uh, on the postal voting, uh, he might actually uh, think of early uh, parliamentary election. Uh, if I may, I'll connect this to a question from Alicia Polakiewicz. Do you think we should connect the crisis of judicially independence in Poland and the presidential elections more? In the end, the Polish Supreme Court decides about the legitimacy of the election. Well, yes, of course, uh, peace uh, has already uh, taken control of the Constitutional Tribunal and uh, nothing wrong could happen uh, to uh, the United uh, Right on this side. Uh, but still, uh, the Supreme Court uh, has a say uh, whether the presidential election uh, is valid. And uh, it is very important, it's crucial for the ruling party uh, to have um, it under its control uh, by uh, before the presidential election. And th I think this will happen. I mean, uh, there will be a new uh, first chairman of the Supreme Court nominated uh, in the coming days uh, before the presidential election. And he will make sure that uh, everything that peace wants uh, will be uh, done by the Supreme Court. I know, I know how to answer you. <laughs> what are other institutions um, supposed to do or what is their mandate like the OSCE and, um, and their election uh, monitoring mission? Who else than the European institutions would have a say? Wojtek. Well, at the end of the day, I guess uh, the civilized world would have to come to terms with uh, Andrzej Duda elected. Uh, it might be some gest there might be some gestures, uh, uh, some perhaps protests in the media, but in the end, I think the leaders of the West uh, would have to come to terms with uh, Mr. Duda being elected. Uh, and uh, I don't believe in any serious uh, troubles from uh, the Western world. If we switch now to economic um, um, impact of the, of the uh, pandemic, of the corona crisis, there is a question from Natalie Nugahed. And again, Natalie, if I may, I invite you to ask the question via video yourself. Okay, hi, hi everybody. Thanks for this discussion. Um, uh, very interesting. Um, my question, my question. Maybe you're reading it on the on the chat, but it's it's about what, what, what are your thoughts about how uh, Hungary and Poland um, will be dealing with the uh, the massive economic recession that we are likely to see and perhaps already seeing across Europe as a result of this pandemic. Um, um, you know, I remember that after the, um, the Eurozone crisis, Poland 
had done pretty well, you know, at least uh, the, the, it was seen that way. Um, this, this is a different picture. And, and also if, if, you know, if there is, there, if there is a recession and a, a country like Hungary is a place where there's a lot of German investments, German business, um, you know, how do you, how do you anticipate, how do you see the governments anticipating this huge economic downturn? And I know it's hard to predict, but what are your thoughts about the political fallout? Thanks. Um, let's start, uh, perhaps we can start with you, Zsuzsa. Uh, sure. Uh, so one thing that the uh, empowerment law also made possible for the government is to address economic uh, questions. And indeed, it has put together an economic uh, recovery package um, in the past weeks, which has been uh, also criticized for not being actually as uh, broad and uh, generous as it is being portrayed. Um, Hungary will most likely be seriously hit by uh, unemployment. There have already been uh, several serious uh, waves of uh, people being let go. Um, but uh, one thing that has not really been considered is to address this situation by, for example, prolonging uh, support for people who are unemployed. The Hungarian government insists on um, maintaining just this three-month uh, unemployment period um, this will probably really hurt uh, a lot of families financially uh, and existentially. Um, another issue that uh, seems to come to mind for me is that the Hungarian uh, economy is really dependent. Uh, it's a very open economy, uh, so it's not uh, going to get away from the crisis probably as easily as a um, decade ago. It is strongly dependent on the German economy and its recovery measures will also uh, depend on how the um, economies of Europe uh, pull itself together. Uh, if you look at financial situation uh, in the past month, uh, or to the foreign has also uh, been significantly uh, losing uh, value, which uh, as far as I know, however, is a regional phenomenon, but uh, not having the euro in this current situation uh, is actually something that could uh, financially, economically backfire uh, in the long run. Wojtek? Um, briefly, uh, the economic situation is, I guess, one of the reasons why Jaroslav Kaczynski uh, is so determined to organize uh, the presidential election in May. Uh, I guess uh, right now uh, people in Poland are still quite optimistic about the economic uh, perspective. Uh, they don't believe that the crisis will hit them. Uh, what we, I mean experts and politicians know for sure that there will be a, a recession uh, is not yet known to a general public. Uh, general public also uh, is fed by uh, the public media, which say that the Polish government will do its best to uh, help uh, people, to help the economy, and everything will be fine. Uh, we will still have uh, all the social programs, benefits, and so on and so on. Uh, so basically, uh, Ex re recession in Poland is widely is expected, but uh, not widely enough, and it hasn't uh, have hit uh, on Poland yet. Uh, so it's one of the reasons that uh, Peace and Andrzej Duda are still so uh, popular with uh, people in Poland. Uh, and I'm afraid we have to leave it there, uh, Wojtek, to include Matthias. We have two minutes left. <coughs> Matthias, in economic terms. Um, both Hungary and Poland are not part of the Eurozone, so their main reliance on the EU help uh, financially will be on EU budget. Um, to answer Natalie's question, what is their perspective then um, from 
And what do you hear in, 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 in discussions before the budget negotiations? I think it's a little bit like it's um, what, what I heard a lot, although, as I said before, econo economy is not kind of like my, my, my main beat, is I think that just the um, Hungary and Poland, uh, the Baltic states, uh, other Visegrad countries, I think they will, they will fight a lot to, to have a lot of cohesion money coming, uh, coming to, uh, to their respective regions uh, over the next seven years. Just, and I think they, they might really be, or they, I think they're really afraid that just like some people or some other member states might try to take all their cohesion money or other, um, uh, uh, other of the billions that, that Brussels like to spread across the region just to the to the COVID funds, and then they might end up in in, in Italy or in France or in Spain. Um, and I think what they stress, and I think kind of rightly so to a certain degree, it's just like the EU has committed itself to to convergence, to to try to bring their um, their uh, the living standards and the, the levels of wealth and prosperity to to a similar end, and I think uh, COVID might be a symmetric crisis right now, but of course the consequences will be very asymmetric. So I think it's a it's a and also very challenging. The rescue, to, if I if I may, uh, the EU rescue will be asymmetric towards the uh, Central Eastern Europeans because part of the region is in the eurozone. Yeah, exactly. So I think just like that's that will be very very hard, kind of like to to square that or just like to. To, um, to 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 address all the challenges, and uh, so I think it's a it's a tough job for um, for the Commission people, for President uh, Jean Michel, who has to organise this. But I think, of course, a lot will also fall on the uh, on the German diplomats who uh, who have to who will take over the the presidency first of July, and I think a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, would have to be done by them, which I think you can say maybe it's good that it's the biggest country who has to do this gigantic task because probably it would be hard for the Croatians to do something like that. But of course, um, that will be uh, it will be challenging to to find a balance of of yeah making everyone uh, maybe not happy but at least satisfied. Our time is up. Thank you very much to Matthias Korb in Brussels, uh, Wojciech Szatski uh, in uh, Warsaw, and Jozana Beck. <laughs> in Berlin for being our speakers. Thank you to my team, Marina Sonseva, Adam Tracik and others for making this possible. And thank you Politica, to Politica Insight for uh, co-hosting this. Um, if you are interested um, from DGAP, we are continuing with our um, online video discussions. Tomorrow our web, web talk starts at 2 p.m. on Russia and response to COVID and what does it mean to Putin system. Thank you very much and have a good day, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.